Let's see what the stew has for us today. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Gnomecast, Gnome Stew's tabletop gaming advice podcast. Here, we talk with the other gnomes about gaming things to avoid becoming part of the stew. And considering this is the 100th episode, we better be super good to avoid becoming part of the anniversary stew. In honor of this momentous episode, we're going to skip our regular format and go straight into talking to as many gnomes as possible. We're asking, what is some jamming advice you would give to your younger self? Let's see what the gnomes have to say. D, you're up. Everyone give it up for our West Coast gnome. So the one thing I'd tell my baby GM self would be the playing field was never level. So stop prepping and preparing like it is. What what do I mean by that? I mean, well, when I first started out playing in 3.5, whenever I would make like a major villain, I would always build the villain as if they were a PC. Do the levels, do all the things, do all the abilities. And I realized that takes a long time, like a really long time. And all that really does is put a lot more stress on the GM if you try building your villains just like PCs, if you try building monsters from the get-go. When you're trying to play on an even playing field with the players, it's not going to work. It's not an even playing field. The GM is always at the advantage, and trying to go onto the same level as the players just creates a weird imbalance. It creates a weird dissonance of where you think it's really balanced because you're on the same level, but when you have like one or two people with the same level of a PC, the PCs will quickly get overwhelmed because you also have, say, the environment or the narration working for you as a GM, and that's not okay. Understanding that the playing field isn't level means it's okay to under or overpower your units. It's okay to create challenges without like having any real backing behind it. I don't need to create a perfectly accurate one-to-one CR5 creature in order to have a cool ability that lets them like absorb lightning from the sky and fire as a lightning bolt. I could just say that happens and attach a DC to it. I mean, that's a D&D centric thing, but whatever. Point is, abilities don't have to be tied to be fair and balanced with the players. Go crazy. Go little. Either or. The game was never balanced to begin with because the GM just holds too much power. So stop trying to pretend like it is. And here is one of our OG gnomes, Troy Taylor himself. 100 episodes. Well done, gnomes. But most especially Angie and John for shepherding the podcast through its earliest days. I tip my red pointed felt cap your way. Then it was a tiny little gnome cast, clambering out into the world, hoping to slip past such garden variety adversaries as caterpillars, frogs, hummingbirds, and trapdoor spiders. Other adversaries showed themselves, and you know them Podcasting Fade, The Echo Chamber, and Original File Corrupter. Good job vanquishing those. Well, Angie asked me to wave my magical wand and give my younger, impressionable self some gaming advice, then share it with you. What can I say? I'd much rather have dropped hints for my investment portfolio, but she said such information would pollute the time stream. Maybe it was Captain Janeway that said that. Or was it Doc Brown? Too much pop culture rattling around in there to keep straight instructions received on Monday, then followed through with on Friday. Well, here's the straight shot from a fellow who pretty much plays one style of game, Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and variants in the D20 sphere. And the message would be this. Stick with your love of the narrative portions of the game. Perhaps you don't recall. But the pendulum had really swung toward the game's crunchier bits, rule systems, and subsystems that promoted a tabletop experience that focused on strategy, moving characters and monsters on a grid, 
relying on combat as a focus for gameplay. Nothing wrong with any of that, if that is your jam. But I found many of the rules of the time confounding. Moreover, the game's tactics were more about splashy effects than supporting outcomes that bolstered the story. It was hard to find a, a game in the public sphere where a strict application of the rules and their many supplements weren't required as player knowledge. And let's say it, a rules protocol for skill challenges seems contrary to the spirit of spontaneous player interaction. Now, now here we are. And those games have experienced phenomenal growth and mainstream acceptance. But only after returning to the concept of making the narrative, the storytelling elements, the backbone of the game. And I couldn't be happier. I think my past self just needs reassurance that the fantasy role-playing ex experience would return to its roots. Just one more thing. I also told my former self to paint like mad. Every miniature you can. It's not that I need minis for grid combat. I just love plopping the right mini down when it matters, you know? This is the NPC you're dealing with. This is the monster threatening to eat you. That's the blue dragon that's been tracking you. Sorry. Sometime between then and now, poorer eyesight and arthritis have definitely slowed my mini's painting. So, crack open the acrylics and the primer and get busy, son. Well, that's about it. Again, congratulations, you gnome podcasters. Keep up the good work and avoid the clematis vines. Hi, everyone out there in Gnome Stew land. This is JT Evans with a bit of advice that I would have given myself 37 years ago when I started in on the wonderful realm of role-playing games. Before I get to the advice, a bit of background. I came up in the RPGs during the 1980s. This was a time when the GM was usually in direct opposition to the players. Yeah, I said that correctly. The GM opposed the players, not the characters. The characters were the tools the players used to overcome the vile and dastardly plots of the game master. The board game mentality of, I must win this game at all costs to all the other players, was still fairly strong in role-playing games during this time. I am certain there were exceptions to this, but I didn't find those until the early 1990s. I really wish I had discovered more accepting GMs earlier in my RPG career. Actually, what I wish for was that the competitive nature of GMs back in the day was the exception, not the rule. Anyway, on to my advice. If I could reach back to 1983 and whisper in my 10-year-old ear, I'd say something along these lines. Be your player's biggest cheerleader. Be on their side. Yeah, you're going to throw obstacles and monsters and traps and pitfalls in front of the characters, but when the players find a cool, unique, or amazing way to succeed despite your best efforts, cheer for them. Smile and laugh and give them high fives along with the treasure hordes and outrageous amounts of experience points that they've earned. You'll be happier for it. Your players will certainly be happier with this approach, and you'll find that the engagement and storytelling will flow more freely when you allow amazing things to happen around your table. So, that's my advice to my 10-year-old self. That's my advice to you, our listeners. And thanks for sticking with us through 100 episodes, and we hope you'll be around for the next 100. Jared, it's your turn. Hey folks, here's our review gnome, Jared Rasher. For the 100th episode of the Gnome Cast, we decided that we were going to give advice to our younger gnome self when we first started gaming. And I thought long and hard about this, and the best gaming advice I could think of to give brand new game playing me for advice is there's going to come a day in a couple years when you're going to think that you're too old for gaming and that it's something you can leave behind. And what you're going to learn a couple more times in your life is that there's never a good time for you to leave gaming behind. It becomes a part of you. It is your creative outlet. It is your social outlet. And sometime in the future, you're going to see that the world really needs a lot more empathy 
and you're going to feel the strength of these games in that they can help to build and create that empathy between people. So in the end, you're going to realize that this gaming habit of yours is a lot more important and a lot more deeply entrenched than you ever realized. And you're way more healthy mentally when you're engaging in these games and cooperating with people to tell stories. And hello, this is Phil Vecchione, gnome and game designer, podcaster, whatever. I'm here to impart some amount of GM advice, wisdom, whatever, uh, to you. So if I was going to give this advice to somebody who's just starting out, if I was going to give this advice to me back when I was starting out as, you know, a fourth grader in uh, Mr. Whittle's classroom, I think the best piece of advice that I could give would be to tell you not to be afraid to fail. You're going to want to run the most awesome game every time that you get to the table. You're going to want every player to love every experience. You're going to want every story to be amazing and every combat to be that you something you would see in an action movie. And it won't always be like that. In fact, a lot of times it's not going to be like that. And when you're starting out, in order to learn, you got to fail. And my best advice is don't be afraid of it. There's always another game to run and fail quickly. So if you've got experimental ideas, try them. Uh, if it blows up, just admit that it didn't work the way you wanted it to. Just be comfortable in the idea of failure so that you can use it as a tool to learn from. So for everything that you do that doesn't work, every clever idea that you had for an adventure that blows up, every villain that you create that your players find a blind spot and take them out before you thought of it, those are all chances to learn. Uh, every time that you run a, a dud session, every time a player gets upset or you lose control of the table, these are all learning moments. And being a GM is about learning. And we don't learn from success, right? We don't learn when we do things right. We learn from failure. So embrace it. Be really good at failing. And fail as much as you possibly can, as quickly as you can. And then later, it won't be so bad. So good luck and... uh Get out there and get GMing, no matter what. Okay, this is Pete Petrusha, staff writer over at Gnome Stew. I'm talking to you today about advice I would give myself when I first started game mastering for the Gnomecast, episode 100. Of all the mistakes I made and of all the things that I thought were bad that got better or that I look back in hindsight and think to myself, hey, that was great. You just didn't know it. You were too nervous. You're too worried. I think the most common mistake I made when I first got into running games was just letting too many people play. There was just too many times that that felt like, I don't know, praise, admiration, uh, you know, it felt like a party. It felt like something that, you know, people wanted to play my game. They wanted to be a part of it. They, you know, they heard good things and I could do this awesome thing and tell awesome stories and show this new game or, you know, uh, something that maybe they hadn't played before. These days, two to four players, there's a reason why most movies only have so many central characters because otherwise you have Game of Thrones and they need their own episodes. And that's that's really hard at the table. It's really hard to share spotlight um, to a degree that everyone feels like they're really engaged for, you know, the hour hours that they play. So, you know, when I was young, it was just I was lost in the fantasy of the more the merrier. And often I ran games at a game store, so there was always more people who could play and more people who were like, hey, what's going on in the back room or what are they playing over there? I hear every Wednesday Pete runs this awesome game of Shadowrun. And um, we even had like overnighters, you know, like stores where they open all – they'd stay up all night and, you know, people could come. And if you had like one of the priority tables, you know, I mean you could have a dozen people who want to show up. And then what you really did – and this is the reason why you don't have too many players – is – uh, only a few people have a good time because everyone else is really just not engaged. Back to the, you know, the number of main characters you see in most, you know, books, TV shows, movies. God, even when you have five or six players, which is kind of the high end of the norm, 
unless it's a party setting, unless it's Dungeons and Dragons, um, we're we're all in it together and we all have our unique abilities, but we're stuck because of technology in the same place at the same time and unable to travel. It's really, really difficult to have everyone having their moments simultaneously. So if you can, stick to two to four. Get that core experience. Make sure that everyone has a lot of quality. And, and the quantity isn't always the best. Cool. Signing off. Hope you enjoy the episode. Bye. Hey there. This is uh, one of the head gnomes, John Arcadian. All right. So what, what advice would I tell my, my just starting out game mastering self? Uh, say yes more often. I was definitely brought up in, in the D&D sort of tradition of, of second E. And, you know, there's that, like, let's make the players really work for this. And uh, I quickly lost that. But I, I could have done it sooner because when you say yes to the players they get to do more things. You can always change your plot, uh, and, and you can let the player's ideas run free within whatever constraint you have. You can always bring it back or, or add a new challenge or change something about it. But, but saying yes lets the players feel like they are affecting the world. The, the time that I kind of lost this and realized this idea was about my seventh or eighth game that I ran when uh, it was a solo game for a player and they went up the wizard's tower and fought off all the things and they encountered the wizard who was like, oh yeah, I forgot I had a, a challenge uh, to come up here and, and get some rewards. So what do you want? And they wanted a magic weapon. And I'm like, ah, I don't, don't really know. You're just a first level. But then, then I realized like, no, no, they just went through all this. So yes, you get a magic weapon. And I, get, I enchanted his axe so that it got more. Then I realized, like, yes, because I said yes to that, I've got an opening in the story here to do something really cool. Well, there was a halfling spirit that had tried this before, and his ghost was trapped here. So the ghost got sucked in, and the magic enchantment to power it. So now the, the player had an axe with a halfling talkative spirit and it was hilarious and he laughed his head off at it and we played that up when he brought his character into the next one but if i hadn't said yes then he wouldn't have had that kind of little story amount to pull through when we used his character in something else so say yes more often just just go with it if the players are asking for it they think it would be fun so respond to that and figure out a new way around because they don't see your plot you can always change it to accommodate their ideas hi everyone this is rob abrazado gnomecast editor and sometimes blogger at gnome stew i wanted to wish my fellow gnomes and all our gnome stew readers and listeners a very happy 100th episode of gnomecast I'm here with advice I would have given younger me when I started GMing. Past Rob, when you start GMing, you're going to want players to roll the dice way more than is necessary. Try not to do that. I don't mean like how you don't need to make rolls to just walk around or eat food. You already know that. I'm talking about those times where they want to take an action that totally makes sense for their character, especially with no stakes attached, but there happens to be a skill for it in the game. Just because the game has a rule for something doesn't mean you have to use that rule every single time. This is especially relevant when the players want their characters to just be cool. Don't risk PC coolness on inconsequential roles. If Sneaky Shadow Boots wants to introduce themselves to an NPC by speaking mysteriously from the darkness, there's no need to make a hide roll to see if they pull that off. They just pull it off. Later on, once the adventure is underway and Sneaky needs to creep past a patrolling guard, then sure, a skill check sounds great. This idea is a little bit say yes or roll the dice, and a little bit rule of cool, both of which you're going to hear a lot more about in the years to come. But mostly, this idea is just only call for a roll if failure would be interesting, which, admittedly, isn't quite as fun to say, but it'll be a lot of fun to play. Let players highlight what they like about their characters. That's why they came to the table. So that's what I've got for you, Past Rob. Enjoy all the years of gaming to come, and keep having fun. Hey folks, Ange here. Now, forgive me if you've heard some of this before, but I've been playing role-playing games for over 30 years, but I really only started GMing about 15 years ago. I've always loved playing RPGs, but I always felt like I couldn't possibly GM, and that left me with limited possibilities for making games happen. Getting gently shoved into GMing was one of the best things that could have happened to me because it opened a door to, well, to quote Aladdin, a whole new world. If I could go back in time and give my early GMing self some advice, I would tell her to focus on the story and worry about the mechanics later. 
I spent nearly the first two decades of my gaming life avoiding GMing because I believed I couldn't possibly run a game. When I started playing, the GM's job was treated as this sacrosanct position of ultimate knowledge. The GM must know all of the rules, because otherwise the players will just run roughshod over them anyway. Now, since I was never a rules expert, I believed no player could ever trust me to run a game. And man, is that some BS. Sure, there was a more adversarial relationship between the players and the GMs back in the day, but the GMs were never as good with the mechanics as they pretended to be, and let's face it, most players will jump at any chance to game. I mean, look at how many of us have stayed in bad games because it was gaming. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important to have an understanding of the game's mechanics, but lack of expertise should never stop you from trying your hand at running a game. You're never going to get good at it until you start doing it. And one of the most important things I've learned over the years since I started GMing is that story is far more important. And that was an area I had plenty of skill in. I'd been reading and telling stories since I was a wee little kid. I had a ton of experience with cooperative storytelling from over the years. And I may not have been an expert in mechanics, but I knew story beats, I knew tropes, I knew genres, and I certainly knew the importance of spreading the spotlight around the table so all the characters get a chance to shine. Those skills are far more important for a GM than I think anyone used to give them credit for. I think we're better about talking about those aspects of running games now, but back when I was just a player and thought I could GM, nope, nobody ever talked about that stuff. It was all mechanics, 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 mechanics. And eh, let's face it, that's not where the game is. Yes, the mechanics are important, but what is it that people talk about after the game? They talk about how great that story was, how awesome that moment was for their character. And some of those may revolve around the mechanics, but have you ever seen the glassy-eyed stares of people around a table when somebody starts going off into a deep talk about how awesome these mechanics were for how their character did this wonderful thing? No, no. It's the story. It's the story that gets us. So... My advice to my younger self and all of you GMs wanting to learn and grow as GMs, focus on the story and let your expertise with the mechanics grow as you play. And there you have it. Hi, friends and fellow gnomes. I'm Senda Leno, and the advice that I would have given my tiny baby GM self when I very, very first started GMing is that you need to find the prep for a game that works for you. And you need to learn what style of GMing you want to do that it's fun for you so that you know how to plan for that. When I first started GMing, I planned a lot in a very stereotypical way. I planned maps and I drew all sorts of things and I wrote tons of notes and I planned out millions of NPCs that I would never use and tons of battles that ended up being very repetitive. And really what that did for me is that I got bogged down in my notes and I would forget things, and then I would worry about the fact that I had forgotten something. I spent a lot of time, the first time I tried to run a game, like D&D 3rd Edition or Pathfinder were the first couple of games I tried to run as a baby GM. And um, what I learned about that particular style of prep work is that it doesn't actually make me feel prepared to run the game. It makes me feel like I'm going to forget a bunch of really important things and ruin the game. And so I spend all my time flipping around through pages. So the thing that I wish that I had known or understood about me in particular is that prep for a game is what you need to make it comfortable for you to run a game. And what I need to make it comfortable for me to run a game is like a list of names and a problem and an understanding of what the opposing force to the PCs wants from this situation. And everything else, I might plan a little bit more. I might have some ideas. But everything else, I can let flow at the table, and I will be much more comfortable because I can't forget anything. I can't mess anything up because there's nothing to mess up. I haven't planned it. So plan for what you need, not for what the stereotypes tell you you should be doing. And have fun. Because if you're not having fun running the game, what's the point anyway? Hi, I'm Chuck Lauer, at Innocuous Chuck on Twitter if you already know me, and one of the great galloping masses of opinionated beardos in gaming space if you don't. I write toilet humor thinly disguised as jamming device on a semi-regular cadence, and make tabletop terrain that can be best described as eh, good enough. 
I first started GMing long before the proliferation of gaming advice. This was also before we really had philosophies and schools of thought about what games should be as an experience or a story. D&D was still the behemoth it is today, though White Wolf had become a powerhouse in its own right, coming out with games, sure, but supplements, video games, art books, and what had to be the single worst soap opera to ever disgrace the television screen. Palladium was still kicking, if weekly, but small indie games had yet to come into their own. This is important because while they were big, at that time games weren't as player-focused or even GM-focused as they are today. We, or at least I, thought games were simply an equation. Rules plus planning equals games, and the more rules or planning you had, the better your game would be. I didn't think I had done my job until I had access to a literal duffel bag full of rulebooks and binders full of backstories for every location, barista, street sweeper, and assistant the players might run into. As you might imagine, I didn't run nearly as many games as I could have, and 99% of that preparation never saw the light of day. So if I could give myself one bit of gaming advice from when I started GMing, it would be this. Any game is better than no game. And you really, really, really don't need as much to get a game running. A hook, a villain, optional, and a world with enough shared understanding to get things moving is enough. A list of names to pull out is also highly recommended, unless you want to panic and name your NPCs after household objects. Your players can help create the world, even if they don't realize it, with the questions they ask, and you can then answer those questions on the fly. If I could give myself a second piece of advice, it would be this. Start crafting. You don't need much. Old cardboard, glue, and cheap craft paint can do magic if you just start. It's lighter, and a better use for that duffel bag, than the Ultimate Psionics Companion 3 Redux. This show is funded by the Gnome Stew Patreon. You too can become a Patreon backer by following the Patreon link on the Gnome Stew website to the Gnome Stew Patreon. This ad is brought to you by all of our amazing patrons. Let's give these amazing folks a round of applause, or at least a bowl of stew. And they are... Amadea Rosa, Bill Carter, Block Party Podcast, Bob Queck, Bruce Cordell, Carla Everson, Chuck, Craig, Craig Deckert, Daniel Markwig, Doug Roz, Erica Bond Barbagris, Eric Bonds, Eric Heimel, Fabrice Bulakia, GM Gerrymander, Greg Gordon, Jen Pixelscapes, Jennifer Kathleen, Jim Anderson, Carl Halperin, Michelle Shepherdson, Panic Productions, Rob Abrazado, Sam Groton, Scott Adams, and Suzanne Cabral. Also, let's give a warm round of thanks to our John Arcadian, our head gnome, our co-head gnome. Because, you know, without him, this wouldn't still be here. Also, thank you to all of our listeners. I still can't quite believe we hit 100 episodes. Here's to 100 more episodes of GMing Advice, Laughter, and the Love of RPGs. See you in the next episode. Gnomecast is hosted by Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs.